We're going to begin the third day of our conference, exploring cultural diplomacy in the European context. Crisis, conflict, and culture, the role of cultural diplomacy in the European project. Today is day three, so I think we'll have a chance uh, to move a little bit from the framework and the theory uh, to some more specific key issues uh, that have really uh, a tremendous impact, I think, on that which is holding Europe together, as well as perhaps that which is breaking it apart. And uh, I'm very happy this morning that we'll have more of an academic morning, uh, joined by two uh, senior experts in the field, one from Belgium uh, and one from Italy. Uh, the first speaker that I'd like to introduce, uh, the first keynote speaker of the day, is Professor Samuel Farfari, who is based currently at the Free University of Brussels. Professor Farfari holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the Free University of Brussels with a focus on the transformation of coal to hydrocarbons. In 1982, he joined the European Commission with a focus on energy policy and was assigned to the Director General for Energy and Transport. In 2008, he served on the European Task Force on Financing Energy Efficiency, Renewable Energy, and carbon capture, and still serves in an advisory capacity. Professor Farfari now teaches the geopolitics of energy at the Free University of Brussels, and is collaborating closely with the European Energy Forum, created by members of the European Parliament. As you all know, energy is one of the key issues uh, that can be a huge challenge or also a huge opportunity uh, in this European project. So I think it'll be very interesting to learn from him how also this issue of energy does have an impact uh, and perhaps how cultural diplomacy can or cannot respond um, based on those uh, implications. The lecture title that he's chosen is Historical Foundations of European Energy Policy and Today's Implications. So if you could please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Professor Samuel Farfari. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice welcome, your nice world, and I'm very pleased to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, welcome in Brussels. I have been presented uh, as Free University and European Commission. This is correct and true, but uh, what I'm going to, to tell you this morning is something a little bit different on the march uh, of uh, the, uh, the, my functions. I, I, I thought that uh, it would be uh, interesting, I hope, that I give you uh, some, a vision which is not a point of actuality today, even if uh, I want to insist a little bit on some aspect of energy and I hope that you will find this uh, interesting. I speak, I would say, at, uh, uh, at my personal name, because what I'm going to say is maybe a little bit politically incorrect, and therefore I want to, uh, to say that it is my personal view. Energy is the blood that flow into the vein of the economy, and I would like with you to reflect on the importance that energy had in the past, as no, and will have in the future. It has also a fundamental role in the construction of the European Union and the, the diplomacy. From this, I will draw some ideas on present moral and spiritual situation of the EU. It's why I told you that it's a little bit on the marge of uh, what you can expect. Why energy is so important? Because in physics, energy is the same notion of work. Work is energy, energy is work. And uh, everybody needs to work, even our own body, to move the blood, to move the hair, need to work. That's the reason why we are taking some energy in the form of food. When you eat, it's because your body needs energy. The notion of work is the multiplication of a force, a weight, on a distance. And therefore, energy results or it's necessary to move a weight, a force, over a distance. 
Should you want to reduce the energy consumption, you should reduce the effort that you make and the distance on which you make the effort. All other type of concept are just dreaming. Utopia. It's like looking back to the development of the perpetuum mobile. This has been abandoned in the 15th century when physicians discover that energy is the multiplication of, of a force over a distance. And because it has been always difficult to work, it's rough, it's difficult, we have used energy from animals. Plugging, carrying, moving around, all type of hard work have been made in the past exploiting the energy of animals. But there is much worse than that. Men start to exploit the energy of men because work is hard. Slavery is the consequence, or was the consequence, of the hardness of the work. Exploitation of man by man is because work is hard. And it's better to do other people, to leave other people, or to oblige other people to do the work. Work is hard. And therefore, there is this quest for energy. Today, you and me, we are using the workforce of 150 people. You have the chance to have daily, 24 hours a day, 360 days a year, 150 slaves or servants or domestic which serve you thanks to the energy that the average European use. Even in India, the poor Indian have 10 domestics, virtual domestic, but they have it. The slavery was a sad, unjust practice. Most of the culture, the tribes, population, have plasticized slavery, practiced slavery, of different form. Fortunately, this has been put to an hand in Europe a few centuries ago. But it took tens of years to William Wilberforce, a UK parliamentary, that want to stop this. He carried this battle because he was a devoted Christian that found that slavery was contrary to the founding message of the Bible and the gospel that insists on the equal value of every man and woman. And therefore, it took years for him to convince others that yes, slavery have to be put to a hand. There is another key moment in the history when Christians have considered energy as an important act. In July 1946, in Switzerland, on the Geneva Lake, in Go, at the Go Palace, there was a, a meeting organized by a group of Christians called Moral Rearmament. Moral rearmament. And the task was to try to remake the post war world. A Lutheran pastor, Frank Buchmann, was leading this group, and they met with uh, the idea to reconcile the nations. While a lot of different people were in this meeting, with their flag, their uh, costume, Frank Buchmann realized that there was a big mistake in this gathering. There was no German invited. And he said, 
you will never rebuild Europe without the Germans. To the surprise of all participants, the following year, Germans were invited, 1946. They were invited, and at this occasion, a French lady called Irene Laure, a member of the French resistance, declared, I hated Germany so much, I wanted to see it erased from the map of Europe, but I've seen here that my, my hatred was wrong. I want to ask all the German present to forgive me. The following year, 1948, 400 German were uh, invited in Co. And among them, a big man, which name you have seen probably in arriving in this building. If you are coming from the other building, in the passerelle, turning here around, you have seen that the passerelle is called Konrad Adenauer. Konrad Adenauer was participating in this co-meeting. And this has changed a lot of things in Germany. There was a moral transformation so evident that the French Prime Minister, Robert Schumann, tried to meet with those people who have arranged for the moral rearmament, and particularly with Frank Buckmann. This man has so good contact with Robert Schumann and Konrad Adenauer that finally the two leaders start to work together to replace mutual suspicion with mutual respect and confidence. And this emerged in the famous declaration of Robert Schumann on the 9th of May, 1950. On that day, the French government presented a bold plan which was supported by Adenauer before end in order to integrate the coal and the steel industry of France, Germany, and all other European countries who wish to join. Implementing this famous declaration, thanks to the reconciliation, the moral rearmament that Frank Buchmann developed, the European industry necessary to make the war was not more no in a common basket. To make war, at that time, you need energy and steel. And at that time, energy was coal. To make war, it was necessary to have coal and steel. Today, we will have electronics. And the famous idea of Schumann, but with the support of Adenauer, was to put together those fundamental industry in order to stop any war in the future. And you have seen that this has been a great success. The preamble of the European coal and steel community says, resolve to substitute for age-old rivalries the merging of their essential interests to create by establishing an economic community the basis for a broader and deeper community among people long divided by bloody conflict and to lay the foundation for institutions which will give direction to a destiny henceforward shared. A few weeks later, Robert Schumann, a devoted, a devoted Catholic, decorated Buckmann, a Lutheran pastor. He decorated him as Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur in recognition of his key role in helping to create the climate in which the new relationship between France and Germany had been rendered possible. At the base of the ECSC Treaty, the Paris Treaty, there was a strange link between materialistic need, energy, and moral and spiritual value. This demonstrates that the minority having a strong conviction 
of the need to respect the other, the need of humility, of forgiveness, of reconciliation, has been able to exercise a disproportionate Café, vous plaît. influence on the course of event. Change of nation, change of economic, change of energy policy start with changed men and women based on sound value. In the declaration of Robert Schumann, there was a phrase that will take us straight to today's situation. A phrase that has been eclipsed, ignored, underestimated. And myself, I'm working since 30 years in this field. I just discovered two years ago in reading again Schumann Declaration. Let's read this sentence. Europe will be able, a sentence of 1950, eh? Europe will be able with more means to pursue the implementation of one of its main duty, the development of African continent. In Paris Declaration, 9 of May, 1950, there was this strange sentence that Europe has the duty to develop African continent. This part of the declaration is a finger pointing toward us because Africa has not developed as the rest of the EU. This has not been made for a number of reasons, but that lay on the fact that the same values that were at the base of the European Union were not implemented in Africa, both by African and European. How can we recover this sad situation? In helping Africa to develop, in helping it to be at work. Do you remember what we said at the beginning? Work is energy. The ECSC Treaty has been successful in contributing to the development of energy situation we enjoy today. But the Paris Treaty and the following treaties did not bring the condition for energy to be available for all African citizens. If all European citizens have access to energy, there are worldwide 1.5 billion of people which do not have access to energy. 20% of the world population. This number is 587 million only in Africa. 2.7 billion, that means 40% of the world population, have to cook with renewable energy. We are so proud to talk about renewable energy in Europe. In a lot of countries of the world, they are cooking with renewable energy. Not solar panel, with animal excrement, and plundering and deforesting the surrounding. How can we address this sad situation? In replicating what William Wilberforce, Robert Schumann, Conrad Adenauer, and others have made. First, to recognize that we are all human beings with the same fundamental value, whatever our cultural heritage. And second, if hope and not to be paralyzed by the present situation, not to fall in the gloom and doom. The situation at the end of the Second World War was much worse than the present one. But our European father built up the reconciliation on base of energy consumption. Bringing more energy is the solution and not blaming energy and accusing other 
to deprive natural resource. Energy is the key for the development and prosperity of human being. It is thanks to the energy that we are no more poor in Europe. And I believe that we should be proud of that, recognize it, and try to do the same for the rest of the world. We are today paying more attention to the depletion of natural resource than to the depletion of our European value, those that set up Europe, and particularly the EU. It is time to recognize that continuing to deplete our traditional belief will lead people to question the very principle that made the greedness of European civilization. A moral and spiritual vacuum is presently taking form in Europe, just when others are more and more proud of their own culture and belief. We are not going to a clash of civilization, but rather toward a collapse of Western civilization. The European heritage needs to be revitalized, restored, and the old standard reinstated. Otherwise, we, we, the wave of hope, tolerance, reconciliation, progress, charity, that was the base of the European Union, will disappear. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Frafari. Uh, we very much appreciate that. And again, I think really one of the pivotal issues uh, that could make or break Europe. So I'm looking forward to your comments and your questions. Um, my question was about biofuels and what you considered um, in regard to Oxfam's um, criticism of biofuels and their use um, as an alternative energy source. And precisely one of the problems that we have today with energy, we are so convinced that fossil fuels are bad that we are doing anything to replace them, including the production of biofuels. When, uh, uh, for years, we were trying to find solutions for biofuels, uh, we knew that it's quite difficult to produce biofuel. It's difficult, it's expensive, and it takes a lot of resource, land, water, and anyway, we say we, we want to do it because we want to uh, reduce our carbon footprint and our, uh, the use of uh, fossil fuels. And as a consequence, we took this decision to go on fossil fuels. And I have to tell you that it has been quite surprising to see the strong opposition for all the Green Party on biofuel. And they are still very uh, tough on that. And uh, it's clear that it's not an easy solution. It, it looks nice, but like a lot of things in the world, you need to wait to see the result. And in energy, like in other type of activities of human being, we need to accept time. Time will give us the right solution, not studies. It's so easy to make studies nowadays. We, everybody have a computer and it's so easy to make models, calculation, projects. The real value is what we will get after a few years. And we have to have the humility to say, when we will see the result, we were wrong. This is what my, I want to say, that we need to have humility in everything like the example I mentioned you. And probably we will say we were wrong in this, 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 and this. Like we, today we are saying that we were wrong when we set up the euro and did, we didn't set up clear rules for handling the financial and the budget of the member state. It takes years. And this is uh, also what happens in our personal life. We are operating by trial and error. So let's wait and don't hope that uh, everything we are doing today uh, is a dream and correct. We'll see. Thank you very much. Next question, please. 
I'm Gerd Rabo from Germany, and now you can expect a question from the German perspective. What is your personal opinion about the U-turn of the German government when it comes to energy policy? For years, we have tried to have a, an article in the treaty, and uh, in the Lisbon Treaty, we have no an article, number 194. We have an article, Treaty 194, which says that we have a common policy between Union and Member State. But the point two of this article in, is saying in diplomatic word, I do what I want with my country and with my resources. That means that even if we say that we have a common policy, when it comes to the selection of fuels, each one is free to do what they want. And so Germany is totally free to believe that wind and solar is the solution and that they can close the nuclear power plant. Nobody can blame them, it's their choice. As I told you, we will see the result in a few years. Mistake in energy, everybody makes mistake in energy. The problem with mistake in energy is that it costs a lot for a number of years a long number of years, because it's not like the dot-com industry. It's heavy, very heavy industry. And therefore, in 10 years, we will see the result of the German decisions. If they were right, it will be perfect. If they were wrong, it will be very expensive, very expensive. There are a lot of studies. There are people saying that it's good with the studies that will create jobs and other which are credible as the first group saying it's completely nonsense. And nobody can say you are right or wrong. It's so difficult and you will see the result in a few years. But you ask me my personal point of view. My personal point of view, I think that's a big mistake. You, uh, you do not stop to drive your own car because your neighbor had an accident with your car. If you trust your car and how you drive it, you will not stop to drive because your neighbor had an accident. I think that uh, it's a, well, Germ we know that Germans do not like nuclear. They are not the only one. It's why they are pushing solar uh, photovoltaic uh, production, but uh, the rest of the world will develop nuclear. India, China, they will, uh, uh, they, they, they will produce more and more nuclear. In 2010, Russia company, Rosatom, it's called, sell power plant to Turkey, Vietnam, Venezuela, Mongolia, China, and India. Koreans are selling plant in Qatar, Emirate, Saudi Arabia. Are they all stupid? I don't believe so. I think that uh, uh, we need all type of energy because we will not be able to live without energy, as I tried to demonstrate it to you. Of course, each one have a personal feeling, and we will see the result in a few years. Uh, my name is Ursula, and I'm from Poland, um, student of, uh, of, of politics and European studies. I'd like to ask you about your comment um, about the energy in the uh, geopolitical context. Um, which way, um, well, uh, we all know that uh, Europe is very much dependent on uh, energy sources from Russia. And I would like to ask you, uh, do you see atomic energy or renewable energy, so, you know, such as solar or wind uh, energy, as a, let's say, better way to get more independence uh, from Russian uh, supplies? Thank you. Today, fossil fuels in Europe represent 81%, 80, uh, 
sorry, 87%. And we expect that in 2030, it will be 21, eight, sorry, 81%. So if you look in percentage, you will see a reduction. But if you look in absolute quantity, there will be an increase for the reason I mentioned you earlier. So believing that we will be able to replace Russian gas with, fossil uh, with uh, renewables energy is really a big exaggeration. It's so difficult and so uh, 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 expensive that we will not replace Russian gas, not today, not in the future, with renewable energy. Let me give you a, 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 an anecdote. The president of the commission, Mr. Barroso, has been uh, one of the most defender of the objective of 20% on renewables energy in 2020. And he was really working hard to get this result. And we got it. So member states are working toward the objective of 20% in renewable energy energy. But as soon as this objective, to, uh, the, this political objective has been agreed, Mr. Barroso start to work on the remaining. And what is the remaining? It's 80 percent. We all talk about the 20 percent and we forget the 80 percent, not the commission. Commission is not forgetting the 80 percent. As I say to, to you at the beginning, since the Treaty of, of Paris, we know that we will need energy. And we are working hard on the 80%. This does not mean that we do not believe in the 20. But we have to work hard to be sure, as you say, that we will have more energy arriving in Europe because we are scarce of energy. How do you explain that Mr. Barroso or Mr. Oettinger our German commissioner, is so often, are so often in Azerbaijan, in Turkmenistan, in Kazakhstan, in Iraq, to bring more energy in Europe. You go on the website and you will see a lot of pictures of my bosses in those countries. And I think they are totally right to do so. Because we have to deal with the 80%. It will not disappear. That's the reason why we have the Nord Stream bringing more gas from Russia to Germany, because Germany needs much more gas, obviously, and even more know that they decide to stop nuclear. Why are we working on the Nabucco? Because we need more gas from the Caspian area or Middle East area to Europe. Why are we promoting LNG terminal everywhere in Europe because we need more flexibility in the gas market. Why my commissioner was three days ago in Qatar for the oil conference? Because we will need oil from Middle East and gas from Middle East and LNG from Middle East. So I think that uh, we need to rebalance everything. Yes, we need to do renewables energy if they are not too expensive but we need to deal with the rest. And of course, I did mention that the best thing to do is to do energy efficiency. That means try to reduce our waste of energy. We are wasting a lot of energy, but we are also developing strategies, directive, technologies to reduce the energy intensity. But as I told you, even if we reduce our energy intensity, the rest of the world will need badly energy. We cannot expect that 1.5 billion will say, I want to save the planet and I do not need energy. We, stop, we should stop to dream. They want energy and they will use energy. Mr. Fufari, thank you very much. Um,
first of all, I, I want to, to say to you that uh, I, I really appreciate the work you do, and I have the opportunity to, to read some books of, of you, and it was very good. And I learned a lot, so very thank you very much. I want thank to you. Tell you. And I have two questions. First of all, you talk about European values, and I want to come back to this notion. Um, during your intervention, you explained the religious background, uh, that the religious background of some leaders help to move in a good way. Um, now, with the financial crisis, um, from my point of view, I understand that, um, in fact, Muslims have some good idea also to manage uh, finance and to manage money. Uh, when you talk about European values uh, and regarding energy policy, do you take into account the change of uh, behaviors of believers or not? And my second question is about uh, nuclear energy. And I'm sorry to say that I'm not agree at all with what you say, <laughs> because I think there is a moral problem about you develop an energy where you can't uh, manage the waste of this energy. And this is a real huge problem. And I think we have a responsibility. And I want to know uh, from you if you have any ideas about that. Thanks. On the first question, I, what, I want to, uh, what I have tried to, to pass to you is to say that people which had the European values have understood that reconciliation is fundamental. And uh, also the fact that we are all human beings and that there is no difference between uh, all human. Accordingly, I think that what we have been lucky to have for more than 50 years till a few, uh, well, let's say for 40 years, was based on this value. Know that Europe is in crisis. I think it's normal to raise the question, to say, well, is it because we uh, develop different values or because even the previous values will not help us? That's the question. We, 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 we have to recognize that we have more or less completely abandoned the values that we had in the past, and we get a new situation. My, my point is we should reflect if this new situation is the consequence of the abandon of the values, and each one can respond for himself. On nuclear waste, European Union have a treaty on nuclear energy. It's Euratom Treaty, signed in, in Rome uh, in uh, 57, implemented in 58. This treaty uh, was developed because the founder of the EU knew that it is impossible to develop EU without much more energy. This is the declaration of Messina in June 55. I think that you should read this declaration of Messina because it's a very important declaration. And this treaty say clearly that we need to develop nuclear energy but in safeguarding all aspects because we knew that there were problems of safeguard. And the problem of safeguard was to avoid proliferation of material, nuclear material and to handle all the safety and security aspect. So our duty as Commission is not to defend nuclear energy, it's why I told you that it's a personal view, but to oblige people who are, use, well, countries and companies which are promoting or using nuclear energy to respect the rule of safeguard and safety and security and to handle properly the waste. And we are working on that. Uh, probably you are not aware, but we have more or less 200 inspectors based in Luxembourg, which are traveling all Euro around Europe to make audit about the safeguard. So we have a, 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 a team of nuclear inspectors 
which go everywhere in Europe to make audit to, to see how this is handled. Regarding the waste, we have also some directives which oblige member states to deal with the waste. Have you have heard any problem with waste since 50 years? You had, you had problem with waste. You are mentioning this problem with the, uh, the, the waste in salt, in the salt mine. Yeah, well, I can, I, it's not the time here to demonstrate this, but this is, uh, this is uh, not correct. It is not so. Uh, waste, it's n furthermore, is not a correct term. It's not a waste. It's a spent fuel, which is totally different. In English, it's a really a spent fuel. What does it mean? <coughs> it means that we ever knew that what is going out for a nuclear power plant is a fuel which present technology is not able to use. But it's a fuel. It's still full of energy. 99.8% of the energy is still there. So it's not waste, it's a fuel. And we are preparing the next generation of nuclear power plant, fourth generation, that we will use this fuel. Third thing, the quantity of fossil fuel, of, uh, of uh, spent fuel, is really ridiculous. It's nothing compared to any type of other fuel, of, of waste in the world. It's totally marginal, and it's handled properly according to the strict rule that we have. They are deposit, vitrified, and deposit in place where, of course, you have not to go to, to make your jogging in that place. They are safe place, controlled, but everything is under control. So, I know that I have not convinced those who don't like nuclear. It's evident. This will never be the case, because it's a question of, uh, it's a personal choice at the end. But I think that the Commission have done the maximum to respect the rules of the treaty, to promote a safe a nuclear industry, and to promote the safeguard. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you all to please assist me in a very warm expression of our gratitude to Dr. Samuel Ferfari. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll have a chance to continue this discussion a little bit on the panel discussion later. I know that there were some other questions and comments.